Hey guys, I got a comment from David Keel. He asked, How did you come to your learning of the importance of obedience to the Lord rather than just believing that God's grace will change you? Did you have any kind of revelation from the Lord after you had obeyed, which caused you to see its importance to walking on the narrow way with the Lord? I'm constantly debating with people who believe that grace alone will change them, and I never hear them speak of repenting. If it's too long an answer, you don't have to say. Maybe you will make a video about it sometime about how you came to learn it. Thank you for your question, Mr. Keel. It is a very good question. I appreciate it. In order to understand exactly where I come from, I, I should actually go back in my past, a little bit of my testimony. I grew up in a household that wasn't a church-going household. It was a believing household. I mean, we believed in God, and I was told about Jesus a couple times in my life. Um, Never went to church apart from just maybe one funeral or one <laughs> baptism, something like that. Um, but my grandmother, whom I spent a lot of time with, actually, uh, she grew up obviously in a different era. And um, the place that, that she grew up in was a place where um, there was like a revival kind of thing that was happening in her day. And actually, it was a distant relative that was leading this revival. It was a pastor in the area that was... Um, kind of like the, uh, the the preacher of the revival. And people would come to this church and experience w uh, wonderful things. And God would really touch them in wonderful ways. So from time to time, my, my grandmother would talk about this and talk about how people would come to church and how, you know, how God would change their life, how they used to drink and now they don't drink anymore and how some people, you know, they would uh, they would backslide and they would go back to the old lifestyle and come back. So I had a little bit of an, of an idea of what happens when somebody really gets saved, really uh, dedicates their life to the Lord and really lives, to, lives for the Lord. Now at the time, I wasn't living for the Lord, especially in my mid, uh, early to mid-teen years. Um, I really, I thought that I, you know, had a faith. To me, I had faith, but I wasn't born again. I wasn't born again until uh, it was just shortly after my 18th birthday. Um, and then I really experienced God's changing power in my life. And when God changed my life, when I really got born again, immediately it was instinctive in me that it was just uh, of utmost importance to obey God. And so uh, I, I tried to obey God in every which way I knew possible. And I got into the Word of God. I started reading the Word of God. And of course, I started attending church as well. Now, after attending church, listening to a lot of different preachers on TV and uh, somewhat a little bit on radio as well, of course, I got in, involved with this teaching of not by works, you know. And so this whole idea that we're, we're saved by, by grace through faith and not by works. Um, how they interpret that is you don't have to do anything. You don't have to obey God at all. It's just that you're saved by grace through faith. And so I got caught up in that teaching for, a, for a, uh, several years. Um, I actually even printed something out and handed, out, handed it out to people, not by works. Because, you know, at the time it's like, I thought, well, everybody believes that they need to um, be good in order to get to heaven. And, and the problem is, of course, is everybody thinks they're good. Everybody and their dog thinks they're good. I mean, even from what I understand, even Hitler thought he was good, okay? Um, so my idea back then was, you know, don't think that you're good because you need to get born again. You need to get... You need to get saved, which is still true in that sense, okay? But later on in my walk with the Lord, after several years, and I was preaching too. I preached a lot uh, on the street in, in uh, different venues, uh, in different places all over the place, uh, going around preaching. But as I read the scriptures and as I meditated upon the Bible, there were many passages that just didn't sit right with me. This is one of them. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21. Now, remember the context here. This is the Apostle Paul telling the church. He said, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, 
heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, anything like this, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past. In other words, Paul told these people, these believers, these Christians, these people of the church who accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, otherwise they wouldn't be part of the church in Galatia, he told them over and over again that those who practice such things will not, you see that, not inherit the kingdom of God. So I started thinking to myself, how does this jive with Paul's teaching about when we're saved by grace through faith, not by works? Because obviously Paul here is talking about obedience. He is preaching obedience. He is telling the church, if you do not obey then you will not inherit the kingdom of God. That means your salvation is at stake here. Obviously, Paul is preaching law here. So it made me think, what does he mean by we're not saved by works then? Well, now I understand there are so many interpretations of that. It's just, it, it's mind boggling. So for a few years, I started saying, well, you know what? We don't get to heaven by works, but we sure can get to hell by works. And then there was another scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Again, remember, this is the Apostle Paul talking to the church, the people that belong to the church. He said, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Some people would say, well, what makes a person righteous opposed to unrighteous? Well, of course, it's not believing or being part of the church, being part of those who believe in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, because why would he even bring this up? It means a lot more than just faith here, okay? Because right here, in context, the last half of this verse defines what the unrighteous is. Obviously, he said, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. That is talking about obedience. And so you must get to the point where you say, enough dancing around this verse, enough making excuses, enough trying to explain away what it obviously says. I think that one of the things that really, uh, one of the steps was 9-11, okay? I know a lot of people, not, a lot of you, you remember 9-11. Some of you may not. 9-11 was, was kind of like a little bit of an eye-opener for me, as it was for many people, because I started wondering, what is it about these, the faith of these people who did what they did? And so I started reading a lot about it. I even downloaded their holy book and read it, and... Um, and studying what they said, and, and listening to videos about what they said. And, and, and I noticed that one of the things that they had against the West was so much sin. And so uh, these people, especially in Muslim countries, even to this day, they have the idea that the West is Christian, and there's so much sin in the West. Um, pornography, abortion, all kinds of stuff just ungodly things, very um, worldly, uh, unholy things, okay? A lot of sin. And they equate that with Christianity. And so that was kind of like um, a first step for me. I started thinking, well, you know what? They really have a point there. There's a lot of people who claim to be Christian, and they are involved in all of these very wicked and abominable things, and even churches that are promoting abominations uh, and, and just being very soft towards sin, even, even promoting sin. And so that really caused me to th say, you know what, um, there is something wrong here in the West. There is something wrong with so-called people who call themselves Christians. Uh, several years after that, there were people that I really began to talk to a lot, people that were from the East, and uh, and they had the same idea uh, about how Christians are just, just very, um, really abominable people because of what the West produces. And so I began to really understand that, you know what, we need to really 
be a better witness for the Lord. I mean, that was like the second step for me. And then the third step for me, and I know this is pretty much unbelievable, uh, and that is that for a certain period of time, I was attending a liberal church, and I spent a lot of time uh, with the pastor. And actually, I got involved um, quite, quite involved with uh, the, uh, the operations of this church. And uh, talking to this pastor, he was a he was a he was a nice man, okay. Um, and so, spending a lot of time with this guy and talking to this guy about uh, things of the scriptures and about lifestyle and, and and about the things of God, you would think that that pastor uh, would have an influence on me uh, to go really liberal. But actually, it was the opposite. And the more I got to know him, the more I heard what he had to say what he had to teach in his his lifestyle and and what he promoted, the more and more disgusted I got with it because I knew it was wrong, very clearly against the scriptures. And this guy doesn't didn't even really believe the scriptures in a sense. I mean, he's a pastor in a large church, at least a large church denomination, and didn't even believe the Bible in that sense. Um, and so that was another step for me. And so to make a long story short, I ended up not going to any church at all. Now, the reasons were various. There were various different reasons why I didn't. It wasn't just one reason. But I ended up not going to any church at all and, and really having like a, uh, an online kind of fellowship. And uh, at that point in time, I really, really got into the scriptures. I really got into the Bible. I was into the Bible very deep before. But then when you withdraw yourself from a certain kind of a social group, um, and that's what a lot of these churches are nowadays, they're just social groups, you are more free to, to actually believe what the Bible actually says. Because when you get into a social group or when you get into a certain church, it is almost inevitable you will identify that church with God and God with that church in the script, in the Bible and everything. So uh, it becomes it, almost like a smokescreen. The teachings of that church can become like a smokescreen to what the, the true, clear, crisp message of the gospel and of the word of God really is. The power of influence is very, very great. I mean, most people don't realize how powerful it is when you attend a church or any kind of social group or a workplace or school, whatever. Influence is there and it's powerful. It can make you believe things that are true that are that are absolutely absurd. I mean, and so you can really easily get off track. And that's what happened, you know, to a lot of groups. A lot of these people, they're obviously against the scriptures. I mean, they really get off on a tangent that is not really uh, reality at all. It's not truth at all. Uh, but they somehow are blinded to common sense, to reality, and to much of what the scripture has to say. So I got into the scriptures for myself, by myself, and the more I read the Bible and the more I meditated upon it, the more I realized how utterly vital obedience is. And the more I researched and the more I educated myself into biblical culture, the more things really become clear to me. And I began to understand things like I never understood them before. Things really did, I mean, the smokescreen really did clear out and I saw things as clear as day. Like, for example, I'll just give you one example. And in a lot of my videos, I go through a lot of these different uh, teachings. But um, for example, in the Bible, in biblical times, the books of Moses was not kept uh, on the same level, was not in the same hierarchy as, let's say, for example, the book of Hosea or the, the book of Psalms. And that was different than the book of Esther. In fact, they didn't have a Bible at all in the Bible. Uh, the biblical church didn't have a Bible. They kept every single scroll in separate places. Every book existed independent of each other on their own scrolls, and the scrolls were kept in certain places respective of their authority and their hierarchy. For example, the books of Moses was kept in a very special place because that author, the author, Moses himself, was a, a very special guy. He had more authority than someone like, you know, Jeremiah had. 
And so I began to realize that not every book of the Bible is created equal. And the fact that publishers today publish the entire Bible in one book, like they, they put all of the books in one book. It's actually doing a great disservice to everybody because you look at it as equal or at least as if it's all part of the Bible. But that's not the way it is at all. The Holy Bible is actually a library consisting of many books, and each book is on a different hierarchy. It's on a different level. Even in the New Testament, what Jesus said, the so-called words in red, have much more authority than what Paul said. And so the more I understood this stuff, and the more I read it, and the more I dug into the cultural context, not just scriptural context, but the cultural context, which really opens up understanding in just amazing ways. Over a period of time, I began to understand that the whole topic of grace versus law or grace versus obedience, there is no verses in there. I mean, the law came by grace. Any parent that has any grace at all would give do's and don'ts to their children. They wouldn't just let their children go and put their hand on a hot stove, okay? They wouldn't just let their children play on the road outside. And if you read something like Psalm 119, you will understand that the law of God is an act of mercy. It is an act of grace. I began to understand that everything from creation until now is by God's grace. God created this world by grace. God made Adam and Eve by grace. God gave them a law by grace. God gave Moses the law by grace. God gives us the grace to receive the law. Actually, to even hold the scripture in our hand is by the grace of Every breath that I breathe is by the grace of God. This video I made by the grace of God. You are listening to this. You have hearing. You have sight. You are able to understand me by the grace of God. By the grace of God, he gave us the power to obey. In fact, that's why Jesus came, to give us the power to be an example and to be crucified so that we can look on him and say, I am crucified with Christ. My old sinful self is dead with him. And I live now not of my own. It is Christ that lives in and through me. That's what it's all about. We obey God's law by his grace. So in a nutshell, that is why I believe the way I do. And I pray that God gives you all, lavishes upon you the spirit of understanding and wisdom and the knowledge of the Lord like you've never had before. Love you guys.